the passive property is now covered, we are ready to go over the mechanisms behind the action potential. To properly understand the action potential, we must begin our discussion by describing how the first recordings of this event even came about. For a long time, the action potential was a very hard phenomenon to measure because as soon as the membrane potential hits a certain threshold, the action potential fires and there is no way to maintain a specific voltage to measure the conductances of the channels involved. The major breakthrough in understanding the action potential down to the electrophysiological level came from experiments made by Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley. These two scientists used the voltage clamp technique to successfully record the currents and conductances that make up the action potential. To appreciate the results and measurements, let me explain how the voltage clamp apparatus works. To do so, let's take a chunk of the axon and place it in a dish. Contrary to most organisms, squids have very big nerve cells that can have diameters up to a thousand times larger than mammalian axons. Hence, the large diameter axon of the squid allows the experimenters to insert electrodes and other electrical equipment without rupturing the cell. For that reason, let's assume right now that we are currently working with the axon of a squid. So, in the first portion of the apparatus, one electrode is placed in the axon and the other electrode is placed in the baiting solution. The two electrodes are then connected to an amplifier which measures the membrane potential. The voltage measured in the amplifier is then connected to another amplifier that compares it to a desired voltage. The desired voltage is often referred to as the command voltage and it is generated from a signal generator. The second amplifier then sends a compensatory current to the axon through two electrodes such that the voltage of the axon is always kept at the command potential. And whenever it is different, current is either sent or withdrawn. The current that goes into the system can then be measured with an ampere meter. To better understand the technique, imagine that we set the command voltage at a higher value than the membrane potential. In this case, to match the command voltage, the membrane potential must get more positive, which implies that the feedback amplifier will inject current into the neuron. In the other scenario, where we set the command voltage lower than the membrane potential, then the membrane potential will have to get more negative to match the command voltage which is accomplished by withdrawing current from the system. Hence, the apparatus continuously provides a negative feedback loop that keeps the membrane potential at the same value as the command voltage. Now, before we examine more thoroughly the different results obtained from the voltage clamp experiment, I want to give you a reminder that the axon is composed out of three main types of channels. There are voltage-gated potassium and sodium channels, as well as leak channels that are always open at rest. These three categories of channels will be of interest for us in this section. Moreover, recall that the membrane current flowing out of the cell is composed of a capacitive and a resistive current which constitute the opposite of the injected current. One positive aspect of the voltage clamp technique is that it essentially removes the capacitive current. Indeed, as we've defined it, the capacitive current is equal to the capacitance of the membrane times the rate of change of the membrane potential with respect to time. But if we hold the membrane potential constant at a value equal to the command voltage, then the capacitive current equals zero. Thus, when the voltage is quote-unquote clamped, the injected current directly equals the resistive current from the three types of channels at the membrane. Now that this is established, let's consider more concrete examples. For the two first examples, Let's plot the membrane potential and the membrane current as a function of time. On the plot of the membrane potential, let's assume that the resting membrane potential is at negative 60 millivolts. While we haven't touched the command voltage yet, the membrane is at rest, so there is no recorded current. In our first trial, let's set the command potential at negative 70 millivolts to slightly hyperpolarize the membrane. Before we see the results, Remember that since the command voltage is below the membrane potential, the voltage clamp will withdraw positive current or in other words send negative current into the system. For the split second that the resting membrane potential adapts to the command voltage, the capacitive current flows and causes this high negative peak. Then, while the axon is clamped, the current that will flow is only from the leak channels until we turn off the system 
and the membrane readapts again with the capacitive current. In the second trial, let's set the command potential at negative 50 millivolts to slightly depolarize the membrane. As expected here, we get the opposite relation with the currents flowing in opposite direction and with the leak channel still being the only ones responsible for the resistive current. Recall that our convention for current says that positive current corresponds to positive charges leaving the cell, which in essence corresponds to a hyperpolarization. Accordingly, negative current corresponds to positive charges entering the cell and depolarizing the cell. In voltage clamp recordings, positive currents are often referred to as outward currents and negative currents as inward currents. Consequently, in the first example, we say that the leaked channels have an inward current, while in the second example, the channels have an outward current. The logic behind this, which ties everything together, is that let's say in the first scenario, the apparatus is trying to make the cell more negative, but the cell wants to be at rest, so to fight the injected hyperpolarizing current, the current going out of the leaked channels will be depolarizing, or in other words, inwards. In the second example, it is the opposite logic. The cell becomes more positive, but wants to be more negative. Thus, it will produce an outward current to hyperpolarize the cell. The take-home message from these two examples is to exemplify the convention of voltage clamp recordings that an inward current represents a depolarization and an outward current represents a hyperpolarization. These definitions are very important because I will keep using them in the next few sections. All right, now for the third trial, let's induce a very big depolarization by setting the command potential at zero millivolts. You can see that now the results are very different from what happened before. Nonetheless, here again, as the membrane potential equilibrates, there is a brief capacitive current that is recorded. Then it is followed by a very brief inward current and then an outward current that persists until it reaches a certain plateau. Through this curve, you can also imagine that there is a certain constant current coming from the leak channels that still flows along. As you can see, the considerably different response between trial 2 and 3 shows that there is a certain voltage dependence. From these results, we can establish that the ionic permeabilities change drastically as a function of voltage and time, but it doesn't tell or at least indicate to us very clearly what ions are involved in the process. To get more intuition about the process, one can perform the voltage clamp experiment at different values of command voltage. With each trial, you can notice that the inward current gets smaller and smaller as the command potential increases up to the point at 60 millivolts where it isn't even present anymore. To understand why this happens, Recall that the equilibrium potential of sodium is about 60 millivolts. Hence, when the axon is clamped at 60 millivolts, there is no net flux of sodium, which indicates that the inward current is most likely controlled by sodium influx. Another line of evidence of sodium's involvement in the process comes from another experiment where the sodium is removed from the extracellular solution. The removal of sodium from the outside solution now makes the equilibrium potential for sodium very negative. Indeed, when the voltage is clamped, there is no early inward current, but rather an early outward current, which further proves that sodium is responsible for the inward current under physiological conditions. This experiment also shows that even without outside sodium, there is still a prolonged outward current, which is caused by another ion. It turns out that this outward current is caused by potassium, which can be proven in multiple ways such as radioactive labeling. But one very compelling proof comes from studies using pharmacological products. Indeed, when one performs the voltage clamp with tetrodotoxin, which is a toxin that blocks voltage-gated sodium channels, you can see in the results that only the delayed outward current is recorded. You will also notice that we are not considering the capacitive current anymore, because it doesn't give any relevant insights on how the action potential works. All right, in another trial, when one uses tetraethyl ammonium, a drug that inhibits the voltage-gated potassium channels, the recordings show only an early inward current, which we know sodium is responsible for.
Thus, we can deduce from these results that potassium is indeed responsible for the outward current. Therefore, when we look back at the original recording, the first bit of current is the transient sodium inward current, which is followed by a delayed outward potassium current. Now that we have a better grasp of which ions are responsible for the action potential, the next step for us is to understand how the conductances of these ions change over time and voltage. As a refresher of what conductances are, recall our equivalent circuit model, which we use to model passive membrane properties. In this circuit, the total membrane current IM is given by the sum of all the currents, which include the capacitive current from the membrane and the three currents coming from the three channel types. We have also established in previous sections that the current that flows through these channels is equal to the conductance times the driving force. From these equations, we can thus get an expression for the conductance of each ion, which is simply the current divided by the driving force. To illustrate how the conductances evolve over time and voltage, let's consider some voltage clamp recordings. So, for our range of membrane potentials, let's simply consider the shapes of the current and the conductances without even thinking of any numbers to see what relations we can establish purely from the curves. Let's begin with sodium. In terms of current, we know that at negative 50 millivolts, there will be no current going through the sodium voltage-gated channels since the threshold will not have been reached yet and thus the channels will still be closed. Accordingly, the conductance through the channel will also be zero. Then, as we pass the threshold to, let's say, negative 20 millivolts, we get the typical inward sodium current. Here, because there is a current flowing, we also record a value of conductance. At zero millivolts, the current and the conductance both increase again, but interestingly, at positive 20 millivolts, the current decreases while the conductance increases again. To understand what happens here, let's use the equation of current as a reference. So, as the membrane potential increases, the conductance increases because it is a property of the channels and the channels themselves are increasingly voltage dependent. Remember, however, that the equilibrium potential of sodium is about 60 millivolts, and thus, as the membrane potential increases, the driving force decreases because Vm and the equilibrium potential of sodium are approaching one another. Indeed, when we consider the plots at 60 millivolts, you can see that there is no net current, even though the conductance is very high. And that is caused because the driving force is zero. On the other hand, when we consider potassium, because its equilibrium potential is very negative, the current and the conductance keep increasing as the membrane potential increases. To better appreciate these results, we can overlap the potassium curves with the sodium ones. From these results, there are two similarities and two differences between the behaviors of sodium and potassium that we can establish. In terms of similarities, notice that the two channels require a threshold and membrane potential to open. Indeed, at some values, like here at negative 50 millivolts, there is no conductance, which implies that the channels are voltage gated. Moreover, you will notice that for both channels, the conductance is proportional to the step in depolarization. When we consider the peak conductance as a function of membrane potential, the relation for both ions is sigmoidal in nature. At a very negative membrane potential, the channels are closed, and no ions cross, whereas at very positive potentials, the conductance plateaus at its highest. We will later see how to obtain this relation. In terms of differences, you can see that the sodium channels open more rapidly and after a short time they inactivate. On the other hand, the opening of potassium channels is more delayed relative to sodium and remains sustained. As a result, the time courses of these two ion channels are very different. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, 
you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.